Um, so I'm going to really focus on just uh, having good decision making. Um, I'd like to start by uh, recognizing that there, this uh, is a drought management series. And uh, as you have probably seen or hopefully have seen on the beef.unl.edu uh, website, that uh, there's four more talks coming up this month that'll dig into some of the specific decisions that you make uh, in the case of a drought. So I won't actually be crunching numbers or talking about uh, um, specific trade-offs tonight. I'll be more or less laying the groundwork for those later, later talks and talking about having good decision-making processes in place and just good habits. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with the, my favorite rhetorical questions, and that is why bother uh, making decisions. Um, and I, I do mean that because I think sometimes we avoid decisions if we can, uh, because in general, decisions are hard. And uh, in agriculture, that's especially the case because in agriculture, we usually have lots of choices. And the big kicker in ag is we have lots of uncertainty involved. Um, so, so it's a valid question. This is hard work to go through and think through decisions and to make them. And, and we tend to procrastinate. And in the uh, process of uh, procrastination. Uh, we do make the decision sometimes easier because some uncertainty goes away, some things reveal themselves. So in the, we're talking about drought tonight, a person could uh, perfectly ask the question, uh, you know, why make all these decisions to how to prepare for a drought when I don't even know if we're going to have one. Let's just wait and see if we have one. Um, and, and, you know, okay, that does make it make it easier. Just wait and see. And if you're in the middle of it, you know, you have to make those decisions and you, and you can crunch through and see see what's uh, possible to do at that point. And the uncertainty has gone away. Certainly, you don't have to sit there and think about uh, the possibility of spending a bunch of money on something, for example, and then not needing it. Um, but we all know that the catch-22 there is, is that a lot of the good alternatives and the good choices go away. Um, so decisions are hard when you have lots of choices and lots of uncertainty, but that's exactly when you want to be making them. You want to put yourself in a position uh, to succeed and to do well. And in order to do that, you just got to accept the fact that you're going to have to sort through a lot of information. So the second bullet point here is one that I uh, am leading to with that uh, uh, conversation. And that is, is that I want you to think that about decisions as being uh, the way that you purposely influence your life, everything else just happens to that to you. In other words, we can't we can't make a decision on whether or not to have a drought. We can decide whether or not to be prepared for a drought, or to just wait and react to a drought. Okay, so that in and of itself is going to have an influence on on uh, the actual impact of the drought. But we can't decide on a drought or not. Um, and another way to look at it is is that it's the, as a business owner, if you think in that. Uh, sense the most powerful thing in the world you can do as a business owner is uh, is actually make a decision to be in a position to make that decision and not have it dictated to you. So that's what controls uh, your success relative to say your peers or your competitors. It's your opportunity to maximize the possibility of achieving achieving your goals and objectives. And profitability is probably in there someplace. Um, and so you need to look at it that way. Uh, in the context of tonight's topic, which is, which is a drought and not knowing whether or not we are going to have a drought, you can also think of decisions as the opportunity to shape the environment in which your decisions are made. Okay, and so in this case, when we are making decisions on preparations in case we have a drought, you're actually controlling some in some uh, ways, some very significant ways, the environment you actually make decisions if a drought does occur, the environment that you'll be dealing with there, the choices that are available to you, uh, the impacts uh, that the drought might be having on you and so on. Um, so I'd like to encourage you to be what we call proactive when it comes to decisions and that is don't avoid them. Uh, don't just tackle decisions when the problems happen and you're forced into making the choice, but be very proactive and look for opportunities to make choices that put you in a good situation. Uh, in this case, uh, in the context that we're having, when we don't have uh, adequate precipitation and, and forages lean. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to rely a lot tonight on this graphic right here that I use to help teach uh, decision making, and it does look busy, and that's on purpose. Um, but this is the decision making process that I teach in the class that I teach here at the university, uh, Advanced Farm Management uh, for the Department of Agriculture Economics. It's also uh, what I teach in extension, in particular in the uh, Nebraska Ranch 
uh, practicum. I've dubbed it Smart Choices in Agriculture. Uh, there's some background. The Smart Choices terminology has been around for about 25 years now in the decision analysis literature. Um, and I've, uh, I've incorporated a lot of those uh, principles into this. Tonight, we're just gonna focus on the top half of this graphic. Um, as I said, there are some other uh, webinars coming up later in the month um, that'll get into some specific alternatives and assessing trade-offs between different things that you might do uh, in case of a drought. Uh, so we're gonna you know, uh, provide just a very uh, superficial attention to that part of it here tonight. Uh, but we're gonna talk about establishing a, a good context for making those decisions. And in other words, just, just preparing yourself uh, to make decisions uh, in, when a drought does occur, but also at this point, some of the decisions that you can make um, to be in a good position then. Um, so the whole idea behind having a process to work from and to think through some of this ahead of time is to make a good decision. So these are the seven characteristics of a good decision um, that are uh, that you wanna look to accomplish. And uh, the first one is to have an appropriate decision frame. And that is uh, in a nutshell to realize what it is that you're trying to accomplish and what you're dealing with there. Um, so the second piece goes right along with that, the objectives that you're trying to accomplish, uh, the values that you're trying to adhere to, what is important to you in this decision, and then what are you dealing with uh, in having to make it. Um, you also want to have creative alternatives to choose from. Um, creative sounds like more of a modern way of saying just good, all good darn alternatives to choose from. Uh, you don't want to have a limited uh, selection there. Um, it's a lot easier to toss out an alternative uh, that maybe isn't uh, isn't the best one uh, for various reasons um, than it is to choose one that you haven't thought of yet. So be creative in thinking of those things and, and have a nice long list there. And sometimes they're mutually exclusive, sometimes they're not. And a lot of times you can take a couple of different alternatives, what you think of initially as different alternatives and iterate uh, to, to a combination that includes the best of both of them. Um, so makes sense, right? You need to have, you need to know what you're dealing with, need to know what you're trying to accomplish. You need to have good things to choose from. Okay, so the top three uh, hopefully are fairly intuitive to you. And obviously you also need to have good information. And as I mentioned with agriculture, a lot of times we're dealing with uncertainty. Um, uh, so even though we might have the best information available, it might not be turn out at least to be the most accurate information uh, because things change and we just don't know how the weather's going to turn out, how the market's going to turn out and a number of other things. Um, with that in place, you need to be able to think through uh, the trade-offs between these different alternatives, how well they accomplish your objectives, uh, trade-offs involving uncertainty and information surrounding them and so on, and use sound reasoning then uh, to, to basically evaluate those trade-offs and make good choices. And when you make those choices, they need to align with your objectives and the values of the things that you're trying to achieve. Uh, point number six might seem elementary to you, but I'll tell you from experience of teaching uh, this in class, um, most of the time, the students uh, will go through, I'll have an example in class, or there may be, sometimes I have them actually bring their own decision in that they're trying to do. And they'll go through and they'll think through all this stuff and then they'll make their choice. And their choice will, the reason they made their choice will not have anything to do with what they've stated as their objectives, okay? And that is not uncommon. There's been a lot of studies that have been done where people up front, when asked what they want to accomplish with their decisions will create a list. Um, and then through the process of making a decision and maybe the process of talking to other people, that list will double and triple in size. And quite often the things that are added to that list are much more important than the things they initially put on the list, if that makes sense. Um, so <laughs> when I said that graphic is, uh, is very busy, there's arrows all over the place. And what that's meant to symbolize is that you're constantly updating your information. The last step here is a commitment to implementation. And uh, in the context of, of tonight, where we're talking about preparing uh, for making decisions in a drought, a lot of the actual decisions you'll be making if a drought does occur, uh, they won't be implemented until then. So you won't be actually committing uh, maybe 
but you also but you'll be putting yourself in a position where you'll have good alternatives to choose from at that point in time and uh, when you make that choice uh, that commitment then of course is really important however there are decisions at this point in time that you uh, may need to commit to doing and that could be putting extra resources in place so that you have different alternatives available to you uh, some of you may be uh, landlords or landowners that are trying to get a lease agreement in place or a tenant that's trying to get a lease in agreement in place uh, that is very accommodating to some different alternatives to address drought. Um, a lot of different things that could be uh, decisions that could be made at this point in time. So those are the characteristics that we're trying to accomplish, uh, you know, by by going through this process of of, uh, of keeping track of what it is that we're trying trying to do, uh, the, the context in which we're making the things, the decision, and then the alternatives that we have to choose from. So let's just hit on the top half of this here tonight. Um, and the first thing that might seem elementary, but it is important, and you'll see why when I uh, talk about it here a little bit, and that is the first step in any decision is to identify that you have a decision. Um, so you recognize the opportunity to make a choice most common way to recognize that is you have two things to at least two things to choose from okay so the alternatives tend to come first in our thought process and then you have a reason to actually choose between them so that would uh, lead you to an objective that you're trying to accomplish okay i'm going to like to challenge you tonight uh, to flip those around and to start thinking about things that you want to choose or want to accomplish or your reason for making choices first and then start filling in alternatives that's where proactive decision making comes into comes into play because if you get uh, very good and very accomplished at this you'll find yourself actually creating decision opportunities not just identifying them when they happen uh, so we call this moving from alternative focused decision making to objective or value focused decision making. So you're trying to create value with these decisions as opposed to looking at it, like I said, like a problem where you, you feel like you're forced to choose between two or three different things and you're trying to trying to just crunch some numbers and see which one is best. OK, so we want to flip these around in context and put objectives first and alternatives next. And that's what uh, we have here in the uh, graphic over here on the right. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time with what's here in blue, which is establishing the context and objectives is the first piece of that. We'll talk about the other pieces. And then out of that, we generate all alternatives. Now, realistically, like I said, you first recognize these sometimes, oh, hey, I got a choice here. I could do A, B, or C. But you'll find me actually, I, it's taken probably five or six years uh, for me to, to start to have trouble thinking that way alternatives first in other words i start to think in terms of what i'm trying to accomplish and then my list of alternatives is endless rather than people saying hey you got to choose uh, uh between this feed source and that feed source i think well what do i what am i trying to accomplish here i'm trying to get feed i want it to be low cost and i want it to be available at the times that i need it and so on and then the choice and then the alternatives becomes a fairly long list Okay, so let's start with just a, a, a stab at what we're working with here tonight at, uh, of identifying a decision opportunity. And I just uh, put some something down that I thought was fairly safe that we all could uh, agree on. And that is uh, the the opportunity that we have available to to us at this point in time is, is decide what uh, we should do or what I should do to prepare for a possible drought. Okay, now for some of you, uh, like I said, you might be somebody working on a lease agreement at this point. You might be somebody um, uh, working on some other decision at this point that you say, okay, that's really important. I need to decide that at this point in time. Um, but this pre preparation for drought is, uh, is, is something that, that, that is affected by that, right? Or is going to affect that other decision. So, so we're going to uh, use this as kind of as our context here tonight. Um, as I said, in the uh, other webinars that will come up later on in the month, they'll, they'll provide other specific production contexts, uh, perhaps something focused on forage or maybe something fo focused on the animal or weather or uh, other different items that we have there. 
Okay, so in establishing the context, the first one is to is to get the uh, objectives identified that you're trying to achieve by making your decision. So we're trying to say, you know, what should I do to prepare for a drought? Uh, why do I, you know, why do I want to make these decisions? Ultimately, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish by by being prepared for a drought? Uh, so we'll talk through that a little bit. Uh, internal context in which I'm making that decision, we need to describe that. That's things on our farm or ranch that we're dealing with. Could be things like finances, could be things like the current state of the range and so on. And then the external context that we're making the decision in. So those would be things like the markets and, and uh, um, you know price of hay, stuff like that, price of the cattle, different things like that that are outside your operation. And then the fourth one is to go ahead and identify all the risk and uncertainties involved. So uh, as I said, as we go through time, some of these uncertainties are resolved. So we need to update uh, what's known and not known. And, and in some cases, update the range of possibilities that are attached to those unknowns. Um, so that's what we mean by establishing the context. So let's start with identifying objectives, okay? And uh, I put these down as steps um, just to help get you started. Uh, but I do call this the art of identifying objectives. That's because it's very personal. So um, what I mean by that is my objectives may or may not be yours. I'll put some examples up here in a moment. You might agree with them, you might not. You might have something totally different. Even if we agree with our objectives, odds are pretty good that there'll be some disagreement perhaps on priorities, okay? So I might have the uh, same objective as you, but, but for me, it's a super high priority. And for you, it's middle of the road or maybe down, down the line a ways. Okay, so how do you start identifying things that are important to you? The easiest thing is to do the best and the worst. So the best is create a wish list. What do you, what would really make you happy? Okay, so we're saying, you know, what should I do to prepare for a possible drought? And you say, well, what would really make me happy if I don't have a drought? Okay, that'd make me happy. What would make me unhappy if I don't have a drought? Well, if I spent a bunch of money preparing for a drought, that would make me unhappy. So there you got an objective that says, I don't, I don't have an unlimited pocketbook here to prepare for a possible drought. I can't buy up all the hay in the land and have it sitting there for me to use just in case. Okay, um, so you start going through that. And, and if you get four or five things that would really make you happy, and you think about what's the worst possible case on that, you've come a long way towards identifying things that you want to accomplish. And by want to accomplish, want to avoid something is an accomplishment. Okay, um, so that's the first step, do that. And um, let me just clarify here a little bit because there is some disagreement uh, on, on uh, what we mean by objectives. And I'm, I'm talking about it in a very simple sense in that I'm talking about directions of improvement for one or more things, one or, one or more attributes. And attributes are just things that you value or measure. Uh, so this simple example here would be profit and debt. Uh, those are two two things that we measure. If we want to make those objectives, we just attach a direction of improvement. So we obviously want to increase profit and we want to decrease debt. Now that's just a simple simple example, but uh, um, that's the context in which which I am using these terms. So when I say objectives, I was just saying what's important and what direction do you want it to move? Okay. If you go ahead and attach a, a specific target to it, then I would talk, call it a goal. Uh, so if my objective is to decrease debt, a goal would just put a target to that and say, I want my uh, debt to be less than 20% of my asset value. So my debt to asset uh, ratio is below 20%. Okay, so that's the context in which I'm talking about it here. So uh, identify what's important and then just make short, clear statements uh, describing what you want to accomplish. Um, so what is that attribute that you're looking at? What direction do you want it to head? And then keep asking yourself why, and uh, why is that important to me? Okay, so um, <laughs> a simple example, I mentioned uh, uh, before something uh, about feed resources, okay? And you say, well, I wanna make sure I always have enough feed resources. So I wanna, uh, uh, for example, I want to uh, decrease the probability I run out of feed, okay? That might be an objective that I clarify to myself. So then ask yourself, why is that important? Because if I run out of feed, uh, then I might have to sell cows. Well, why is that important? Because then that, that means I, I end up with a lower uh, 
uh, basis of, of cow numbers and I'm going to have to then rebuild the herd and it's going to affect down the road. And ultimately, that's probably going to come back to affect profit and so on and so forth. Okay, same thing goes that you might say, if I run out of forage, then I'm going to have to buy forage. You know, if, if I have to buy forage, why is that a big deal? Because I might have to buy it in the middle of a drought when prices are high, that's going to increase my cost, same thing. So if you just keep asking why, ultimately a lot of those things will end up being a profit or piece as kind of a fundamental objective or maybe a risk piece or something else like that, okay? So those are what we call fundamental objectives. When we reach that end, all the rest are what we call means objectives. And so fundamental objectives cap captures those fundamental reasons, those fundamental things that you're trying to accomplish, okay? And they'll ultimately, that's where you wanna evaluate your alternatives from, okay? Means objectives are things that feed into that. And the thing about means objectives is to remember is they really are good resources for identifying alternatives, being creative, okay? So if I just said, if you just told me I, I, I wanna increase profits, I would be kind of lost on that, right? Well, what do you mean? When it, there's 10,000 things you could do there, okay? Means object is say, I want to de decrease my cost of feed or decrease my cost of production. Then we start to talk about things that you can do specifically uh, to accomplish that. And those things you can do become alternatives, okay? So this is just a, a simple example um, of a, an objectives hierarchy. Um, and I would just, I mean, these, these can get complicated in a hurry. And I tried to keep this in the context of a drought without going too deep into the weeds. Um, but everybody in general has some sort of overarching primary objective in their life, right? And, uh, and I just said, maximize quality of life. You might have something more specific you want to say there, but there's some sort of happiness thing at, at the top of this hierarchy. The fundamental objectives are those core things that feed into that, okay? So I've already mentioned uh, things like maximize net income um, and then also minimize risk. In most agriculture operations, these are pretty easy uh, fundamental objectives to pull out, right? Most people wanna make more money and they want it to be more stable or less susceptible to, to, uh, to bad things happening, okay? Uh, so for most ag operations, I see people list out anywhere from two to five uh, fundamental objectives. And the ones that just do two don't want to get into the personal stuff, because usually the ones that you see over here on the right hand side of this or however you uh, set it up are a little more personal. So there's usually something about your health, right? Uh, or, um, you know, physically and mentally, you want to be uh, a happy person in some sort. That's obviously going to feed into your quality of life. That may be a family uh, stated as a family uh, objective. Um, and, uh, and there could be something on there about um, uh, passing down the family farm. That's another common one uh, that we see uh, is a fundamental objective for an operation. Uh, the other one I don't have up here would be something like environmental uh, stewardship or something like that. That's something that's real personal and important to you in terms of your operation. Um, but you, it's not a long list here, okay? Two to five, um, you know, usually it's more than two, but uh, you get past five and you're kind of digging into things where they're kind of relying on e each, each other a little bit more. The means objectives then feed into that. So those are the things that I mentioned, like minimizing the cost of production, maximizing revenue are obviously the two most obvious ways uh, to maximize your net income. Um, and then you say, okay, so how do I minimize uh, cost of uh, production? I can decrease my feed costs. How do I decrease my feed costs? I can improve the productive value of the land. So the range is producing more. Um, and, um, and then uh, I can decrease my reliance on purchase of feed. A lot of these things are intertwined down here on the bottom. Um, and then they, they feed in ultimately uh, to the fundamental goals of making money and decreasing risk. Uh, so a couple of things on here as I was putting this together as it came to mind, and one of them was, is, is how do we measure risk in this? And of course, that's a big word. Um, and then I said, okay, so if we think about that in this context, what is it? What is the ultimate risk I'm trying to manage here? And I'm trying to maximize the probability I make money, okay? That my sale price for my animals is above my cost of production. 
Okay, so that's how I chose to characterize that. You may characterize it slightly different, um, but uh, but anyway, that's the way I put it. That gives me something something to tie on to. Now I don't have absolute numbers there. I don't know exactly what my probability is. I may not even know what, exactly what my cost of production is, but I know the information I need to start uh, go gathering and putting together uh, to make this a reality that I am uh, increasing the probability I make money. Okay, so some someplace in here then is this uh, notion that we're talking about tonight of minimizing the impact of, of a drought. Notice I said minimize the impact because we cannot affect the probability of a drought. Um, but certainly if we can minimize the impact of it, then that's gonna help improve the, pro the probability we actually uh, make money. Okay. <clears throat> So that's not gonna be perfect when you first put it down. The main idea of doing that is to get an idea of what you're trying to accomplish and uh, to start to put that at the forefront of your thought rather than the idea that I just have to make these choices and these are my alternatives, how do I analyze them? If you get in the habit of doing that, it'll help you identify choices you can make rather than choices you have to make. And that's a much better position to be in. Okay, they'll help you also determine the information that you need. I alluded to that here. When I started saying, it's easy to say, I want to minimize risk. It's a lot harder to say, how am I going to measure that? What do I really mean by that? And as I start to put words to that and say, okay, so, uh, you know, it really looks like then I need to start getting information on what the possible sale prices are going to be for my animals. And I need to start putting together information or make sure I have information uh, that leads me to my cost of production. Okay, and so on. So you can see as you start to think through what's important to you, how you're going to measure it, the direction you want to take things, then you really start to gather the information you need to make good choices. Okay, it also helps you to determine the importance of decisions. Okay, so you can come across some, some objectives that you have, and you can easily see how making that better Okay, making that, a, uh, you know, maximizing that or increasing that or whatever, however it's worded, affects like three or four different things in your operation. Okay, and then that becomes a fairly important uh, objective that you're trying to achieve. So decisions um, that help, uh, help you achieve that objective take on much higher importance. Okay, and once you have this stuff together, of course, it helps speed up the evaluation of your decision choices. And then it also helps you explain the choices you make to others, both inside and outside your operation. And so objectives really help clear up a lot of the fog if you take the time to work your way through it. Okay, so I tell my students, I tell producers, let your objectives be your guide. They're going to identify your choices. They're going to help you gather the information you need to make good choices, help you evaluate those alternatives um, that help you achieve those objectives. And then when it's all said and done and somebody says, why did you do that? You say, I did that because I wanted to do accomplish this, this, and this. And that was my best way to, to get that done. I would also say when you're asking uh, experts for advice, it's really great when you can clearly articulate your objectives because a lot of times that helps them really give better advice, right? Because sometimes what you ask it, it is what they tell you is based off of what you ask. So giving them more context for what you're trying to accomplish sometimes takes things in a different direction. Yeah, good point. And I'll come back to that here in a moment when I get, when I, uh, step into the next phase here. But on this case, you know, again, I'm being very generic with this. And so if if I'm looking at this and I say, I wanna maximize the probability, maximize the probability I make money, right? My sale price exceeds my cost of production. I need to be realistic and, and write down the fact that, that there's a short-term answer to this question, right? What's going on this year, but then there's also a long-term answer to this question. And quite often with these uh, potentially catastrophic or very impactful events like a drought, it's this long-term one that we really need to, to pay some attention to. Um, and then maximize profit. I mean, these, these are pretty, pretty elementary here. I didn't step out of my bounds too much. You, you probably have a, a longer list here and a little more detail of things that are really important to you. Okay, so those are the objectives. And to Mary's point about the uh, experts, um, these people ask me sometimes, why do you have all these arrows? That's just confusing. 
Um, no, it's meant to be simple. And that is, is that you should, as you do all of this stuff, some of this stuff you, you do on your own, obviously objectives are, are very personal, but you need to communicate that to your experts and to your consultants that you're working with so that they know it, just like Mary said, and then you need to keep updating things. So you may have, think you have your objectives all the way figured out and you say, I really want to accomplish this, this and that. And they may say, well, in order to do that, you need to also accomplish this other thing. And it helps you build out that list and, and get it better involved. Um, but it also helps them give you good alternatives and, or to work from and, and do the assessment phase. Um, so that's really important to do there. All right, so the internal situation and the external conditions and the risks are the other piece of it. Um, and this is, like I said, you're just, in general, just writing down what you're dealing with. So in the case of a drought, you got your uh, range conditions that you're working with. Uh, you may have some fencing situations. Maybe you got a lot of permanent fence, a lot of cross fence. Maybe you got uh, temporary fencing things that you can put up. Uh, your current cattle inventory that you're dealing with, uh, not just the numbers, but also the types of cattle. Uh, the labor situation that you're working with. Are you short of labor, long on labor? Uh, different things that you have there to work with. Again, being prepared for a drought that you have. And then your finances, right? What is your financial cushion? How much pressure is there on there? Again, there's a lot of other things you can do here, but these are just like the top five that came to mind as I was thinking about, uh, you know, internal conditions when it comes to a, a drought, okay? Um, yeah, somebody mentioned the family in here. <laughs> and that is important, you know, in terms of just keeping the family uh, involved with it and uh, and aware of the situation that's going on. But, but uh, that's the internal context and these things do change and I know in the upcoming webinars uh, they're going to be talking a lot about range conditions and of course monitoring those range conditions throughout the year is very important um, but first you got to recognize that right and so that you go out and do that and you see if those are changing or not externally um, sorry I got to click back here I keep forgetting it it won't react once I go look at stuff. Um, things like the uh, the markets, right? So the near nearby forage market, if I do run short, what's that look like? Uh, currently, I might be looking at hay prices being reasonable, grazing land being fairly expensive. So maybe if I want to get extra forage in place, harvested forages might be a better route to go currently, but I want to recognize that and monitor that and see how that goes. Cattle markets, uh, where are they at now? What are they projected to be when I'm selling? Is there ways I can protect that maybe? I don't know, you know, what, what's being offered out there in the marketplace for that stuff. Weather forecasts, I think next week's webinar is gonna talk about using weather information. What's the current forecast? Uh, staying on top of that, how that's gonna change. Um, the status of USDA disaster programs, uh, certainly in a drought situation, the uh, um, forest disaster program could come into play. And then uh, insurance options too. And I'm gonna mention a, a couple of those here just in a second. And then the last uh, piece to that establishing the context is the risk is and uncertainties. Of all this stuff I'm writing down up here and trying to forecast and look at, what are the major uncertainties? Um, and again, what are the worst case scenarios? What are the best case scenarios? What's the most likely scenarios? What are some of the probabilities attached to that? Um, and again, some cases people give you, you got a lot of information to work with and it's very definitive. Other cases, you're just making a, your best educated guess, right? What's those range of possibilities and, and what's the probabilities? How certain am I that I'm gonna be in the middle or may, maybe the possibilities that it could be at one of the extremes? Um, so it's just this overall uh, inventory of where things are at. Now, I just want to mention a couple of things here on the disaster programs and the insurance options. Since we are talking about drought, um, there is insurance options uh, that are applicable in a drought situation. Some of you are probably a bit, uh, familiar with the pasture, rangeland, and forage insurance uh, that's available for established forage. It's, it's triggered by a rainfall index. You insure over the calendar year with that. Um, it's a group insurance and it's they're roughly 16 by 16 mile grids. That's one option to deal with the possibility or the risk of low rainfall. Uh, on the market side, 
Um, there's livestock risk protection insurance um, that helps protect market price. So for example, if you don't want to be selling, if you're worried about drought impacting prices and having to sell into a downer market as everybody tries to liquidate uh, animals out of their herd, uh, you can help protect that with livestock risk protection insurance. And if you haven't checked into that lately, they've made a lot of changes to it lately up the, the uh, um, premium subsidy. So it's it's much less expensive than it used to be. And one of the things that in particular that pertains to drought is they open the window uh, from 30 days to 60 days in which you can sell those animals and still have the insurance in place. So it used to be if your insurance uh, target date, end date, uh, say it was the 1st of October, then you had to keep your uh, possession of your animals until the 1st of September in order for the insurance to be in place for you because you had to keep it within a 30 day window of its end date. They've expanded that now to 60 days. So uh, it makes it more appealing in regards to trying to ensure that end date and, and you can sell them up to 60 days early and still have the risk protection coverage in place. Those are RMA products available at rma.usda.gov. And then the disaster programs that I mentioned, the livestock forage disaster program in particular, um, that's available from the Farm Service Agency. And the, the thing on these is these are a little more delayed. The disaster has to be de uh, declared by somebody else. Then you go down to your Farm Service Agency office and sign up for it. So certainly being aware of that those exist and, and uh, whether or not a disaster per disaster has been declared is one of the things I would mention in terms of that external context um, that you're dealing with. If, they, if they've declared that, you certainly wanna be aware of that. Okay, <clears throat> so, so this is, uh, you know, most of what I wanted to do here was just this idea of establishing what it is that you're dealing with for your context. Now, when I put this together, uh, there was, uh, these five key principles I was trying to do, and to, as Mary mentioned, risk management is, a, is an area that I kind of specialize in. So I've been doing risk management for a long, long time. Um, and uh, so I wanted to make sure that whatever I outline for people to kind of use as a guide for making decisions, um, that it, it kept, adhered to these uh, good uh, risk management culture principles or the five key principles of a good risk management culture as I've called them. Uh, the first one is the ability to anticipate decisions. So that's the idea of knowing what you want to accomplish and not just identify decision opportunities, but creatively look for them. So anticipate that next decision opportunity uh, so that you're gathering information and you're aware of uh, when that choice uh, can be made or perhaps when it has to be made before the uh, alternatives go away. Uh, you want to have adequate resources and capacity to respond to changing conditions. And that's where all of this communication and the ability to revi review, re measure, and revise information comes into play. You don't want to do this in isolation. Even on a small family farm, communicate with your spouse, communicate with your uh, sons and daughters or, or relatives that are working on there, or, or maybe your employees, and then also communicate with experts outside. Um, build up that capacity and that and those resources available uh, to respond to those changing conditions. And then the free flow of information uh, into and outside of the organization, I uh, mentioned that already, and then the willingness to learn and adapt. And then finally, embed risk management into all decision making processes. And, and most of the decision making processes I looked at and over the years, the risk piece showed up down here at the bottom, uh, at the very tail end, when you're about to make a choice, you do some risk analysis on it. Um, and most of the ones that I've dealt with. And uh, I was adamant that if you're gonna do risk management the right way, you need to identify those uncertainties up front. And as you go through and evaluate things, keep updating the information that you have available uh, in terms of those risk and uncertainties. Uh, you could be adding new uncertainties that you hadn't thought of before. You could be uh, changing uncertainties into, into more certain information as more information is learned. So then the last uh, one that I really want to emphasize tonight is this generating alternatives, okay? And um, there's some there's a little bit of art to that too. Keep in mind alternatives are just possible courses of actions that you can take to accomplish your objectives. So think about it that open. Be creative, do your own thinking first, 
Um, and I emphasize that because once people start giving you choices or alternatives that you can do, sometimes you can box yourself in and your best alternatives don't come to mind. And nobody can create alternatives for your operation like you can because nobody knows it as well as you do. So if, you're, if this is on your mind and you're attending these upcoming webinars, I challenge you to, to think about things that you can do on your operation before you start um, gathering information from the experts. Um, so how can you accomplish the objectives, the things that are important to you? Um, and what objective does this alternative address? Those are two common questions looking at it front and back. Okay, so if something is appealing to you, then you need to say, well, why is that appealing to me? What does it help me address? And then what else could possibly help me address that too? What other alternatives are out there? So do that thinking on your own first, ask others for suggestions, tap into the experts, and then by all means, iterate and generate better alternatives. Because quite often the first ones you lay down won't be the best ones. The best ones will be uh, a conglomerations of things that you've thought of and you've iterated and you've added one, two, one or two little uh, key pieces to it that you didn't think of initially uh, to make it even better. Okay, and then the assessment phase you'll get over the next uh, next uh, four weeks, um, you know, just evaluating the consequences of different things you can do, some of the uncertainties and risk analysis involved in there, and ultimately, you know, how do they trade off, right? If I have extra feed, uh, if that's something I'm wanting to accomplish, and there's four or five different ways I can do that, I know that you have one on uh, planting annual forage, you have things on stocking rate. Uh, you know, a lot of different ways that you can make sure that you have extra feed resources in reserve um, and you need to evaluate the pluses and minuses of each of those approaches. Okay, so um, just an emphasis then, uh, you know, make sure that you're, you're thinking about uh, risk management all the way through and thinking about information flowing in and out and learn and adapt. It's not never going to be perfect the first time through um, and you're going to need to be doing this, you know, just as a out of habit, right? Because we make hundreds of, literally hundreds of decisions every day and we can't sit there and analyze every every single one like it's life or death. But if we get really good at knowing what we want to accomplish, the context in which we're dealing with uh, internally and externally and any uncertainties we're dealing with, we can become really good at making everyday decisions uh, fairly consistently as well as the big ones that we deal with occasionally. <clears throat> 